Together for Christmas, a play written and performed by the Bispo Creative Writers.
and hash browns. I love those. Are my favorites. And French toast and and scrambled eggs. And home fries and sirloin. <laughs> and sausage and uh, and fruit. And you lost me a fruit. What was that in here? Never mind. <laughs> Anyways, once we were all stuffed, we piled on the big old couch, all twelve of us, and the dog. And then we opened presents. From oldest to youngest. You youngins be lucky we didn't keep that tradition. Yeah. After a whole hour. There was one big present left under the tree. It is exactly what I had wished for. A bright red electric train set. You had electricity back then? <laughs> Christmas, it seemed, was finally working out. That's the spirit, Grandpa. Isn't Christmas great? Yeah. Because not too soon after that, my big sisters, Linda and Catherine, were pogoing on their pogo sticks when they pogo right into my train set and crushed it. <gasps> and you all wonder why I don't like Christmas. But when my toy broke last Christmas, Santa brought me a brand new one the very next day. He did. Yeah, I guess. Santa brought me a new one, too, and yeah, that all worked out in the end, after all. All right, the end. Yay! Come on, let's put out Santa's cookies and go to bed. Yay, our special family recipe. Christmas is a time for family. You are right, Polly. I'm Polly. And I'm Molly. And you're Holly, and I love you all the same. Grandpa, we almost forgot your present. We made it ourselves. It's paper. It's for you to put on top of the tree. It's, uh, it's perfect. You know what? I think you all ought to put it on this year. Wow! <laughs> I'm sorry. So, what made your Christmas so, so bad so anyways? I guess it wasn't so bad after all, but this year, with all of us together, we're going to have the best Christmas yet.
Thank you.
It's been a while since we've written to you. Since I last sat on your lap and smiled for the camera. This year, years have been hard. <laughs> they've been heartbreaking. At times, they've seemed impossible. We've been lost and then lost again. And we are tired of losing. Losing time. Losing hope. Losing, losing the children the that we were. We are tired of life slipping through our fingertips. And that's why we are writing to you. Dear St. Nicholas. Dear Father Christmas. Chris Kringle. Right jolly old elf. Dear Santa Claus. We need you. We need your kindness and your compassion and your spirit. But above all else, we, we need, need your magic. I remember when we were little and covered the floor with paper and colored pencils, scribbling out our heart's desires. When our letters read, Dear Santa, please bring me a bow and arrow, a telescope, a real life pony, a palomino with a long mane that blows in the wind. Please bring me Barbie dolls and transformers. And one of those giant stuffed animals that's taller than me. Dear Santa, I want a Lego Batmobile with 136 pieces. I want a pretty wood guitar to match Daddy's. I want you to take my brothers back to the North Pole with you to work as elves. <laughs> Next year's American Girl doll, even though it isn't out yet. And, and we, we wish it was still that simple. We, we wish we could still pick what we want out of the catalog. But this year, we aren't asking you for what we want. We're asking you for what we need. Santa, we know this is a lot, and maybe it's impossible. You might need a bigger sack and a few more elves, but this Christmas we need hope, hope love, compassion, compassion, a full house on Christmas Day, with sugar cookies warming in the oven, wrapping paper falling to the floor like snow, twinkling lights and twinkling eyes. We need a moment to catch up, to stop time, and to settle in the memories. We need a Christmas where we finally feel together again. But Santa, Christmas is just one day. We need your help. Your magic. Every day. The world is so, so loud, and we've forgotten how to listen to each other. We need to turn down the volume, to remember the sound and the power of silence. In the quiet, we learn to create and imagine and be. Learn what it means to believe. And we believe in you. Dear, Dear Santa, I am going to put out milk and cookies for you on Christmas Eve. I am going to leave out carrots for the reindeer and put on my favorite holiday pajamas. I am going to go to sleep early so that tomorrow will come sooner because we can't wait any longer. Dear Santa, tomorrow when we look beneath the Christmas tree, we don't want to see boxes with pretty bows. I want to look out the frosted window and see people helping one another on the street. I want to see my neighbors gathered together around the dining room table. The children outside in pajamas and winter coats, riding new bikes and new sleds. I want these children, all children, to still wish for everything that we did when we were younger. A bow and arrow. A Palomino pony. A white Christmas. Christmas. Dear Santa, we know this is a big list. Probably the biggest one we've ever written. But we're asking for everyone. For, for all of us. We're not wide-eyed and innocent anymore. We know this won't happen overnight. But we have hope. And, and you have magic. Happy holidays.
me cue the hopes and fears of all the years all met in thee tonight. Welcome to the Burlington Arcade, London, Christmas Eve, 1870. The Jewel of Mayfair. Quite hectic this time of year. Over 70 shops with everything from hats, hosiery, linens, lace, gloves, shoes, jewelry, you name it. Happy Christmas indeed. If on the street you can find costermongers peddling their cocks, selling their wares for mere shillings, and their children running amok and panhandling the passers by. Yes, only two rules in this here arcade. No singing and no whistling, because pickpockets and bags and ladies use that as a way to signal the presence of coppers. Only the song of the carolers of nearby St. James Church echoes its way into these halls on Christmas Eve. Why, I find the peaceful singing a nice change from the frantic shoppers picking up last minute gifts for the arrival of Father Christmas. That is, if. Father Christmas arrives this year. You see, things in London haven't been the same as of late. Just back in June, we lost the great storyteller himself, Mr. Charles Dickens. You may have heard of him, especially around this time of year. His stories of creepy ghosts and last-minute redemptions with joyous endings as sweet as Christmas cake. His death brought about many reactions from Londoners, some good, some missing that bit of Christmas spirit. In fact, there is a story about a young costumonger's daughter who innocently feared that the death of Charles Dickens would mean the end of Christmas altogether. And that, dear ladies and gents, is where we spin a tale on this fine Christmas Eve. Indigenous people of this country was quite appalled. And how do you describe Fagin on the twists 
fight, I'd break into that. But Mr. Dickens was a champion for the poor. He certainly lent his pants with silver coins. Right about you, Lord. Oh, now that, Mark, hold on. Take that back, please. No one loves Christmas more than Mr. Dickens. No one. <laughs> Christmas into a prophet. I'm afraid you're wrong. Mr. Dickens adored Christmas. Truly. All of his lovely parties. Dickens and his like were all fancied up on 48 Downey Street when you and your father were stuck in a shack in St. John's. With a big burgling prophet pot of bland with him. And you two were out scrounging when they crossed the bed. With lovely families and friends gathered around the warm fire. Well, poor mother Miss you was freezing out in the cold of night. Stop! The lot of you! Don't listen to them, love. What makes this young child such an expert on Charles Dickens anyway? Because Dickens, like celebrating Christmas itself, has become a tradition for us. Ever since we lost the mum, God rest his soul, I've read to my daughter for Mr. Dickens five Christmas novellas. Each year, a different novella. Every Christmas Eve, another story. Such wonderful stories. Kept us warm all those Christmas nights in St. Giles, when there wasn't much waiting for us on Christmas morning. Oh. That's it, Father. That's, that's all they need. Those stories, tell them. The power of Mr. Dickens' nails will change their hearts. I just know it. They don't want to hear any stories. Why well, you just have to try. If you can change just one of their hearts, you will be worth it. Please, for me. Okay, for you, my sweet darling. I will. Oh, who has time for stories? I have to get home to my wife and children. And I have a suitor or two, Ray. All we ask is that you listen and open your heart on this Christmas Eve, please. <sighs> Thank you. Go on, Father. Start with my favorite. You know the one. How can I forget? The Cricket on the Hearth by Mr. Charles Dickens. <laughs> hey, Kellis, hang me up with a little background music to set the scene. Um, for Pete's sake, go on then, sing. Who's this, Pete? It's a story <laughs> about a family and their new baby, a lost love in disguise. And the old toy maker, Caleb Plum, and his blind dad, Bertha. She would see lies onto the dogs. And even though Bertha was blind, she would see true goodness in people, even if there wasn't any good to see. Except you said the toy maker isn't the only one, the blind daughter. And as they celebrated Christmas, a cricket on the hat watched over them, protecting them. Much like the bells on Dickens' tails, the chimes! The tail portrait effects to set into madness. Madness seems to be grudging these days. Even though Troy lost faith in the working class book, it saw them as an evil on society. He welcomed the young one fit, and it's all from these little in, and took his home, and shed little food he had. And the spirit in the bell tower showed Trotty that the working class aren't evil after all. And restored his friend. Right, in time for a glorious riding of his daughter on New Year's Eve. These are all stories coming from a man with an overactive imagination, with too much time and money to know anything about the working class. I agree. Now he's dead. I seem to forget about Dickens and Christmas. Well, Father, give this story to me. They're losing faith. Right, I'll have off the other novellas like I'm alive. Like the battle of life. Right, in this story, <laughs> Dr. Denner has two daughters, Grace and Mary, who return to the father's apple field. Marion <laughs> is betrothed to Alfred. But Marion makes the ultimate sacrifice and runs away to our Grace and Alfred to marry. Only to return six years later. To a wonderful reunion. <laughs> Such nonsense. I fight for my man, even if it was my sister. And Lord help the sister who comes between me and my man. <laughs> Where have I heard that before? What do you say? What does any of this have to do with Christmas? It's the messages of sacrifice and hope. And family and love. Can't we just cancel this and get on with our lives? They sound much like the lost twin from Dickens' novella, The Haunted Man, and The Ghost's Bargain. Do not tell that one. Oh, shall we sit down at this point? When Redlaw, a chemistry teacher, is visited by his phantom twin, he begs the specter to allow him to forget his sorrow 
This guy's wrongdoing, and all of the trouble he has known throughout his entire life. Represented by a barefooted boy, Red Light learns that Christmas is a time to make peace with painful memories and forgive one another and try to become a better, more forgiving human being. I am sure there are many of us who could use some forgiveness, not only at Christmas, but year round. Well, there may be a couple of ladies who think I did them wrong. But how can I help it if their man prefers me? And I may know a couple of business associates who are girls for their forgiveness. I could swallow my pride and ask my wife and daughter to come home for Christmas. Not me. I haven't done any wrong to anybody. Never. Your mere presence offends me. See? There's always signs to take hearts. Much like Mr. Dickens did with Ebenezer Scrooge. Oh dear, here comes the Scrooge saga. <laughs> Mr. Dickens' best Christmas is about a Christmas cow. I love three spirits show Mr. Scrooge his past, present, and future. Took the death of a young boy, tiny Tim, to turn Scrooge around from his pessimistic ways. <laughs> My doll and I have shown you off Mr. Dickens' Christmas past novellas. What say about your present and future Christmases? I say... I say... <clears throat> we begin by Dickens and Castle Christmas! Good day, all! All this Christmas talk, I'm sorry, but it's just stuff and nonsense. Miss Mings? The stories were that sweet. And your doctor is very lovely. But I just remember <coughs> my birthday's tomorrow, December 25th. Even if we cancel Christmas, I'll still get gifts from my suitors. <laughs> Cheers. I forget to even came to the arcade. Oh well. There's always next year. If there is Christmas next year. Miss Klaftroff? Oh, bah! You know the rest of the line. <laughs> I guess, it's as I feel it. The spirit of Christmas has been buried with Mr. Dickens. Never! Look at me! Christmas won't die with Mr. Dickens! It can never die! Because, you see, Mr. Dickens didn't give us Christmas. What he gave us was hope. Hope that we could change. Hope that we could be better people. Just like Mr. Dickens had hope for himself as a flawed man, I'm certain of it. Now let's see a smile. There it is. That's all the Christmas present I need. Let's pack up, head back to St. Giles, and, and sell him for Christmas Eve. Oh, well, Father, you haven't sold anything. And I won't put a penny, and even an eighth penny on this old man's heart. We have nothing. We have each other. A mystic and storage to keep us warm. Let's go home and read one. My favorite book? Your favorite one it is. Mr. Prang! I've been thinking about what you said. I do believe people can change. And you and your daughter have changed me with your spirit of resilience, love, and Christmas. I'm going after my wife and daughter to bring them home. And... Okay. God save the Queen! I'll take the lot of it, and I'll take this. Merry Christmas, Costamonga! Merry Christmas, Costamonga's daughter! That it does! And what is the line that little tiny Tim tells us? God bless us! No need. They know the rest.
with a class on a cold winter's day. The halls are all decked, the children at play. But one single child is standing alone, his mouth in a frown and his head hanging low. The teacher comes over and asks, what's the matter? I don't have a gift. This can't get better. I know Secret Santa is this afternoon, but I don't have the money and I need one soon. Well, little one, do I have a story for you? It's about a little snowman who is feeling quite blue. She gathers the students and sits in her chair. Johnny, please sit. No, don't pull on her hair. With the children all settled, Miss Winters began. Now, this is my story. I was a snowman. You don't look like a snowman. The children all cried. Well, sometimes there are things that you can't see with your eyes. She opens the book and shushes the class. Johnny, I said to sit down on your ass. I was saying, <laughs> this story is true. And by the end, I think you'll all believe it too. Noelle was a snowman. And she didn't have much. She was missing a hat and buttons and such. She liked who she was, but just wasn't sure. And sometimes she wished for just a little bit more. <coughs> then, on one snowy day, when the well was feeling down, a little granny came into town. She was knitting a scarf made of Christmassy red and wrapped it around Noelle's snowy little head. Thank you so much. Noelle cheered with glee. I'm finally starting to feel more like me. You're very welcome. The granny replied, giving to others makes me feel good inside. <laughs> the day grew long, and as nighttime fell, Noelle saw a sleigh and heard jingling bells. She followed the sound to see reindeer in rows. And when they turned and saw her, they took note of her nose. Would you like a carrot? We have some to share. No nose with that scarf is just plain unfair. Noelle said, thank you. So happy she could cry. Merry Christmas, they said, and took off towards the sky. <laughs> The very next morning, on Christmas Day, three little children came out to play. Noelle held her breath. Could it be? Are you building a snow friend just for me? Yes, we are, the children replied. They took out some sunglasses and made her two eyes. With one final flourish, they put a hat on her head. It's Christmas. And the best gift of all, the friends played together. The air filled with laughter, and they all lived happily, happily ever after. Miss <laughs> Winters closes the book, and the class starts to shout. That wasn't real! Johnny says with a pout. Christmas is for presents, not friendship, just toys. No, Johnny, you're wrong. Says the present. Boy. I'm your secret Santa, but I don't have a gift, so I hope this makes your spirits lift. And the once lonely child, lonely no more, gives Johnny a hug, and his heart does soar. By the end of the day, all the kids take part in learning a lesson about giving from the heart. Well, have a good break, Miss Winter said with cheer, and I'll see you all again after the new year. Bye. <laughs>